So good evening, everyone. Uh, my name's Helen. I work for Devon Wildlife Trust on the Green Mines project in Plymouth. Uh, Devon Wildlife Trust are a partner on this exciting project. Uh, it's led by Plymouth City Council. Uh, it's funded by the European Regional Development Fund's Urban Innovative Actions, and it runs until August this year. And it's a fantastic opportunity to bring our experience and our enthusiasm for wildlife and nature to a green and blue space, or the green and blue spaces in a large city like Plymouth. And we're doing things, lots of things, but uh, you can find out more on the greenmindsplymouth.com website, but things like training community groups with skills to monitor their patch, uh, working with the council to see meadow improvements across the city, helping set up a tree nursery at Dareford Community Park, and taking action for insects by looking at alternatives to pesticide use around the city. That's just a little snapshot of some of the things I'm working on. And we want to make space for nature while helping local people reconnect with the natural world and getting all of the physical and mental health benefits we know this can bring. So, as I said, take a look at the website, you'll find out more. We've got some other talks coming up and then as we move into the spring, summer, some other, some events that you could actually come along to in person. So on to this evening's talk, I'm going to learn all about wetlands. Uh, our speaker tonight is Jack Rivers. I'll let him uh, introduce himself in a minute. Uh, and then we've also um, we're ha pleased to have Andrew Clanfield from Plymouth City Council, who will be doing a little bit at the end of the talk. So over to you, Jack. Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, lovely to have you all here today. Uh, I'm Jack. I work for the Devon Biodiversity Records Centre. Uh, and so our day to day job really is recording all of the wildlife throughout Devon. Um, and I tend to go and assist in a lot of those surveys. But one of my main roles is uh, the community side of things. So that's why I'm here today to talk about wetlands. So I'm a bit of a jack of all trades ecologist, really. So I'm not much of a specialist in anything. Um, but I do really love wetlands, so hopefully today I'll have enough knowledge to get by. But um, yeah, it's really great that you're all here to learn about wetlands. Um, they're a really fantastic habitat and they're often overlooked for green spaces like woodlands. Um, so hopefully today we can develop a bit of a greater appreciation for them. Um, now wetlands are massively varied, um, so we won't cover everything in detail. Instead, I hope to give you an overview of wetlands within the UK, and I'll go through some of the key species um, and the importance of wetlands in urban environment. And then later on, we'll have Andrew speaking about some of the great work going on in Plymouth Central Park and discuss some sustainable, uh, sustainable urban drainage. Um, so there will be questions at the end, um, so do save them up and we'll do our best to answer them. So. First up, what is a wetland? Well, a wetland is any habitat that is seasonally or permanently inundated with water. And this is important as often people assume that water must be present all year round for something to be a wetland. So even those wetlands that are permanently inundated with water will fluctuate throughout the year. And I'm sure last year you would have observed how dry the summer was and that had massive impacts throughout the entire landscape. Now, if you consider those environments which are solely reliant on water, then you can understand that that will have a massive impact on wetlands. But due to this variability, wetlands are incredibly dynamic habitats. And that means there are lots of ways in which species can specialize to survive within them. And over time, they've evolved to live and thrive within these environments. And this has resulted in wetlands being incredibly biodiverse habitats which basically means that they support a massive number of unique species. And I think I was reading earlier that 40% of uh, all the world's species can be found within wetland habitats. So what do you typically think of when you think of wetlands? Well, you might think of a pond like in this first picture or a lake, it's kind of <laughs> it's somewhere in between really, um, but it could be a natural pool that's developed over time or it could just be one that someone's dug in their back garden. Now, ponds and pools are one of the most common types of wetlands, and they're really important for wildlife as they often provide vital stepping stones for species, which essentially means it helps species move throughout the landscape uh, from one pond to another, and then maybe into other wetland ecosystems. 
personally, um, I went to University in Wales and I spent a lot of time in bogs. So my mind goes straight to bogs when I think of wetlands. Um, and that is just, yeah, solely due to the amount of time I've spent traipsing around them. But the UK is really renowned for its bogs and we have a unique climate that supports them. And bogs are really important for storing carbon. Um, but they also support some of our most diverse species uh, and particularly mosses, which I'll come on to a bit later on. Um, and then finally, with many of you based in Plymouth, you may think about an estuary. And we're lucky to have many of these throughout Devon, such as the Plym and the X. And these can support a large array of important plants and wading birds and many other species. However, as you can see, there are actually a whole host of different wetlands, uh, which are all unique ecosystems in their own rights, and as such support different communities. Now, these are just a few of the key types of wetlands, and I'm sure there are more. Um, but even these wetlands have their own subcommunities that differ from one another. For example, fens might be uh, really reliant on rainwater or ground fed water. Um, they will vary dependent on the altitude and that can really influence the species and plants that you can find there. So something as small as a ditch can provide a really valuable network across the landscape for species. In the UK, they're actually really important for supporting some of our rarer amphibians. Um, so you might have heard of a great crested newt, and these will use um, these wet ditches throughout the year to move about the landscape. Uh, next up is wet woodlands, uh, and these can often be ancient. And to me, they're somewhat reminiscent of primordial swamps, uh, but they're often quite inaccessible habitats in the UK. Um, However, they're really great as they have the combined benefit of both storing carbon um, through the development of peat, which is essentially broken, partially broken down organic matter. Uh, but they also store a load of carbon in the trees that grow there. And often the species that grow there, such as willow, tend to send out lots of shoots, which store even more carbon. Um, so they do support a whole host of really interesting species and they're definitely one of my favourite habitats to visit, even if they are quite awkward to get to. Uh, and in some ways, you could even consider them to be the UK's equivalent to some of the mangrove swamps you might find in the tropics. Now, you might see on the screen there is also flood meadows somewhere. Um, and these are once really common and frequently used habitats throughout Britain, sort of after woodlands got cleared. Um, but sort of ever since they've been in massive decline. Uh, and that's mostly as a result of agricultural intensification um, and also the altering of river, uh, well, that's mostly due to the altering of river courses, uh, increase in fertilizer use uh, and changes to stocking methods, which have all contributed to this decline. However, we're only now, well, We've understood it for a while, but now we're beginning to understand that uh, they once had a really important role in the landscape. And actually, they still have a really important role today as they can help mitigate against flooding uh, by acting as seasonal, seasonal washlands, which means that as the riverbanks fill out, you have those areas where water can be stored. Um, but they're also really notable for supporting some really rare plant species, such as marsh sinkfoil and a whole variety of really stunning orchids. Uh, now, Plymouth in particular hosts a variety of marine habitats, which are also technically wetlands. Uh, and these marine habitats are some of the most biodiverse on the planet. Now, I'm a terrestrial ecologist, so these all seem completely alien to me, um, but I think that's just part of their beauty, really. And then finally, uh, there are our rivers and our streams, which are just essential for all life on Earth. Uh, they act as vast corridors which connect and transport species throughout our landscapes uh, and they distribute water throughout their basins and can even impact upon weather patterns globally and that is really key for life to survive and thrive um, but not only that they also store massive amounts of carbon through the plants that grow within these river systems um, and they also build up organic matter as well So why are wetlands important? Well, I've kind of alluded to it, but for one, they have a vital role to play in combating climate change. 
Uh, and that's primarily through accumulating dead organic matter, which can store vast amounts of carbon. Now, I've mentioned it before, but peat is one of the most important forms of this. And this is commonly formed in bogs and fens. Um, so essentially the acidic conditions that you find in these environments, the water logging and the low nutrient and oxygen availability make it the perfect environment to prevent the full breakdown of plants and any other dead organic matter. So that forms peat, which is essentially partially broken down uh, matter, and that stores vast amounts of, um, of carbon. But it's not just in these uh, fens and bogs, coastal wetlands also store vast amounts of carbon. Um, and I read a figure that said that they actually store carbon 55 times faster than rainforests, which is often the habitat that gets most of their headlines. So in addition to that, peat and vegetation play a really key role in filtering our water, uh, with both silt and chemicals being impeded just by their presence alone. So as well as all of our water cleaning systems we have, actually natural vegetation and peat can also do wonders for our water. And this has a massive overall effect on the quality of water and that benefits both ourselves and ecosystems. So especially in Devon and throughout the UK, flooding is getting worse and worse. Uh, and wetlands are essential for managing water and flooding. So the structure of wetlands is vital to this as meandering flows of rivers and streams extend the time it takes for water to travel from one area to another. And throughout the UK, we are now seeing a form of rewilding or renaturalization, which has a really fantastic name. It's called rewiggling, um, and whereby the natural course of rivers or streams are restored, and that's either through digging new channels or by removing any infrastructure that was used to straighten those rivers in the first place. Now, peat comes into it once again, as peat can also help slow down the flow of water as it kind of acts like a leaky dam of sorts. So wetlands are just brilliant overall. Um, some of the other things that we might take for granted is the health benefits they provide. Um, they also provide us with food all throughout the world and also water security for approximately 4 billion people around the world. And finally, wetlands are the most biodiverse habitat on Earth, as they provide home for more than 100,000 different species of animal. Uh, and this is due to the sheer variety of niches which species can occupy within wetlands. Now, niche essentially means that there is uh, so many environments and conditions that multiple species can thrive in the same place. Uh, as they will occupy different niches. So going off that last theme of biodiversity, I thought I'd highlight some of the key species which wetlands can support. Now there's thousands of these, so I've just picked out a few of my favorites, but um, yeah, we'll start off with amphibians. Um, now amphibians are some of our most specialized organisms on the planet, and they've evolved alongside wetlands to become the unique organisms that they are. Now, the majority of them are really heavily reliant on wetland habitat to reproduce, such as frogs, um, and they'll spend most of their adult life on land and in ponds, but they're solely reliant on water and pools uh, when they're in their tadpole stage. Uh, and although there are amphibians which have evolved to bypass this, they're all still found in damp places. So uh, you might have species in rainforests that might not actually utilize ponds or pools, but are still found in those really damp environments. Now, the UK is relatively scarce in amphibians, and we only have seven different species. Um, and that includes three types of newt, two types of toad, and two types of frog. Um, and some of these are quite rare, um, but yeah, you most likely will have seen frogs and toads, um, if you're lucky enough, a few different kinds of newts. So, Amphibians play important roles in controlling pest insects and invertebrates even, but they're also a vital food source themselves, uh, as often our birds will feed off of them. There's even records of mammals such as otters, badgers, and even hedgehogs being recorded as targeting amphibians. Now, sadly, amphibians have been hit hard by wetland losses and disease globally. 
with approximately 40% of those species being considered to be in decline. Um, and it's really vital that wetlands are maintained and supported to help these really amazing creatures survive. So next up, the birds. Uh, and these are one of the species that you're most typically uh, associate with wetlands. And rightly so, as they're some of our most distinctive uh, animals within the UK, uh, particularly things like waders and some of our really specialized raptors. Um, so estuaries and floodplains are really important for wading species uh, as they've evolved to utilize the mudflats to forage. So most species have adapted to hunt different aquatic organisms. So pictured above is a curlew, and uh, they'll use their long beaks to delve deep in the mud uh, to find worms. But then you'll have other species such as lapwings, which have much shorter beaks, uh, and they'll instead try and skin insects off the surface of the water. So some of our most distinctive predators can be found in wetlands, and that includes things like marsh harriers, which will pick up young ducklings from the water, um, and also things such as ospreys, which feed solely on fish, uh, and they're therefore reliant on a healthy wetland ecosystem to be able to plunge in and pick out those fish. So with ospreys, they actually went extinct uh, in 1840 in England and 1916 in Scotland. And although there were a few uh, individuals that would uh, come through as passing migrants, they were fully considered extinct. However, in 1954, they actually managed to recolonize Scotland and they slowly began to repopulate there. Um, however, this was at quite a slow rate and that's been attributed to things like egg collectors and pesticides, um, which have really negative effects on a success rate of young. Um, and since then, they have slowly been recolonizing parts of England, um, both naturally and through reintroduction. So we don't actually have any breeding pairs in Devon at the moment, um, but there have been sightings. Um, I was in a meeting today, which was actually discussing uh, ospreys utilizing a uh, wetland site that was uh, being restored from agricultural land. So they are migratory and they will overwinter in Africa, um, but they are present throughout the UK in the summer. So if you're lucky enough, you might even see one in Devon uh, this year. Um, but another thing that's affecting birds quite a lot at the moment is bird flu, and currently it's really prevalent throughout the UK, and our coastal birds are suffering as a result of this. Uh, but also things like intensive agriculture and human development are also contributing to excessive strain on these species. So once again, it is really important that wetlands are protected and restored to actually support them. Now, some of the most charismatic species are mammals and wetland support a whole host of these, with otters, bats and now beavers being great examples. So wetland ecosystems provide ideal habitats for insects and therefore provide fantastic hunting ground for bats. So pictured above is a Dorbenton, uh, otherwise known as the water bat. Uh, and this is a terrible pun, but they, they really are amazing acrobats uh, and have evolved to feed upon various insects that live on and above the water. So they use something called echolocation to identify their prey. And they will either catch them mid-flight, mere inches above the water, uh, or they'll even use their tails to flick up insects off of the surface and feed on them then. Um, so if you're ever walking near a body of water at night time, do keep an eye out and you might be lucky enough to spot one. They're usually sort of quite a dark shape, moving quite fastly above the water. Um, but also you can pick them up on back detectors. So if you have one of those or have the opportunity to go out and use one, and that's a brilliant way to, to find bats. Now, we also have otters all throughout the UK, and they've made a massive resurgence, and populations are, have been continually expanding over the past 25 years. So they utilize a whole variety of wetland ecosystems and are one of the top predators within them. So these are actually a really key species in highlighting pollutants in our river systems in the 1950s and 60s. They're really dramatic to find in population. However, they sort of have made that resurgence and they continue to be a really distinctive mammal in the UK. And they really are incredibly charismatic if you're lucky enough to observe them. 
I know I used to uh, sit by the harbour at uni and uh, there was an author that would regularly visit that area. Uh, and they're just brilliant to watch. And finally, there's a new species back on the block, or well, technically an old species, and that's the beaver. Uh, and they've been reintroduced throughout the UK, but are thriving particularly well in Devon. And these are what we call an ecosystem engineer, which is essentially a species that distinctively shapes or alter habitats. They both create, support, and thrive in wetland environments. And they can re-naturalize our waterways or re-wiggle, if you quite like that term. Um, and they really do contribute massively to preventing flooding and slowing down the movement of water in environments, which has a knock-on effect of creating pools, which can then benefit uh, fish levels. And therefore, you have your uh, predatory birds again. So they're brilliant. Um, but yeah, the dams, channels, and woodlands environments they create do support a much larger array of species. And it's actually a really uh, exciting a part of ecology to keep an eye on within the UK. So I've been lucky enough recently to help out and conduct some beaver surveys. And I've seen a whole variety of fungi growing on some of the chewed up wood that I've never noticed before. And also another thing is actually the plant communities that are growing up around where these beavers are active are so diverse that they don't necessarily fit into the traditional habitats that we'd associate with these areas. So yeah, they're brilliant. So, yeah, there's so many different things I could cover, um, but I thought I'd just mention a few plants and invertebrates. Um, and yeah, I've covered the most charismatic ones. Um, so yeah, I think it, I should do them justice and at least mention them. Um, so wetlands are a real bastion for insects uh, with species utilizing many different aspects of wetlands to survive. So dragonflies are one of our most spectacular and well-known wetland insects, and they spend their larval life in amongst the water, where they're top predators, and then they'll emerge and breed around those wetland environments. However, insects are also vital for some of our wetland plants, um, and most of the time you think of them as pollinators. But actually, uh, believe it or not, we have our own carnivorous plants in the UK, uh, which is pictured above in the middle. And this is a sundew, and these will trap flies within their sticky flowers and slowly dissolve them over time to extract all those important nutrients, which they wouldn't be able to gather from the kind of wetland environments they're in anyway. Naturally, these are up on Dartmoor, so you can go and see them locally. And finally, uh, one of the most important mosses in the world can be found in amongst wetlands, and those that's sphagnum moss. Um, now, there are a whole variety of these mosses, but they're typically found in bogs and fens, um, and you can find them up on Dartmoor. Uh, and they have an amazing sponge-like ability to absorb and retain water, which keep our wetlands nice and hydrated. Um, but they're also one of those key peat-forming plants, and therefore contribute to that whole carbon storage. Uh, and they're even historically used to staunch the flow of blood from wounds because of that sponge-like ability. So they've even saved human lives. So what are some threats to wetlands? Well, one of the big ones is agriculture. So agricultural expansion and intensification is one of the leading contributors to the decline and loss of wetlands. So historically, wetland systems have been drained for the purpose of grazing animals. And this both alters and destroys the ecosystem. Uh, and as such has left many of the wetlands in the UK either lost or degraded. As agriculture has intensified, uh, the use of chemicals such as pesticides and fertilizers have become way more prevalent. And these not only kill lots of microorganisms and species present in the wetlands, but they also change the actual chemical composition of those wetlands themselves, um, which can favor other species such as algae. Um, and these algae will become dominant within a wetland and essentially prevent anything else from living there. And that renders those habitats uninhabitable with those large blooms. Now, in some cases, these chemical changes will reach a tipping point uh, whereby the previous composition of a wetland ecosystem can't be restored. So it's no longer redeemable. So large irrigation systems and damming can also impact upon seasonal water levels. 
and that can shift those really complex patterns of ecosystems which species are reliant on. So for example, amphibians are often reliant on seasonal ponds for reproduction. However, if those dry out as a result of water control, then this can lead to poor survivorship of young or even lead to the decline in populations and even extinction in some extreme cases. Now, global warming is affecting pretty much everything, uh, but its effect on wetland systems are particularly destructive. So changes to weather patterns and global temperatures can lead to both excessive flooding and the complete drying out of areas. And this disturbs the fundamental processes of healthy wetland ecosystems. So increasing temperatures can also contribute to the melting of ice globally, which instead of drying areas out, will actually raise sea levels, uh, which can completely flood areas or actually introduce salty water into those environments, which can destroy really delicate habitats. So rising temperatures and changes to habitats will also put pressure on species to find more climatically suitable habitats, which forces them to migrate out of areas which they're typically comfortable in. However, this can also contribute to the spread of disease and invasive species. So with disease, if there is a species that's suffering in one area, they're then forced to move somewhere else and they can pass it on. Uh, but alternatively, if there's nowhere else to go, uh, then that can even lead to the extinction of species as a whole, particularly those that aren't as mobile. So as wetlands dry, so does the peat and other uh, organic matter that's formed over many years. And that can further increase uh, carbon loss from wetlands. And that can further exaggerate uh, climate change. So kind of a, quite an intensive cycle. So another one is human development. And this has been one of the main driving factors of the overall loss of wetlands, simply due to the conversion of land to either urban environments or infrastructure or agriculture, as previously mentioned. So other pollutants uh, derived from sewage, machinery and industry can also make their way into our water systems uh, and wetlands, which changes their chemical balance and render some of them uninhabitable. Now, it's estimated that 80 percent of our global wastewater is released into wetlands untreated. Uh, so pollution from factories, fertilizers, pesticides or from major spills can all pose really serious threats to wildlife. So another thing is compacted ground uh, and widespread concrete in urban areas can also prevent water from being absorbed into the ground and slowed, um, which can exacerbate flooding and contribute to further pollution by actually picking up those chemicals off the surface and spreading them further. Um, and as such, urbanization can lead to more plastics and pollutants in our wetlands. However, often forgotten about are the increase in sound and light, which can be just as harmful uh, to species and the natural environment. And these are often overlooked. And finally, there's invasive species. Uh, now, for those of you that are unaware of non-native invasive species, essentially they're organisms that have been introduced from outside of an ecosystem, and they can cause really negative disruption and harm to the environment. Now, often there are no natural predators uh, or control measures that can counteract these species um, as they're not native to the environments that they're introduced to. So they can easily thrive and become dominant. In the, in the case of plants uh, such as pygmyweed, which is pictured in the top left, so that's the lighter green thing matting the ground, um, it can really quickly take over ponds and lakes and choke out the native plants and species. Now, I know there's a lot of issues with this all over the UK uh, and in the Lake District in particular, and it can easily be introduced uh, into ecosystems as one plant, of which will then quickly reproduce. And it's really easy to spread. Um, for example, they can easily get trapped on sports equipment, such as kayaks and paddle boards. Uh, and often these are transported all throughout the UK and used on multiple water systems and lakes. Um, so if you are ever in any of these areas, do make sure you clean it down. So it's not just plants. Uh, there are also other animals. So there's uh, crayfish known as the signal crayfish. Uh, these both compete with our native crayfish uh, for the actual habitat themselves. But they have also introduced a disease which has resulted in massive declines in our native crayfish populations. Um, and that's had a really big impact on wetlands. 
Now, there are loads of invasive species. Um, however, hopefully it gives you a bit of an insight and understanding of how they can impact on wetlands. So I've given you a quick overview of wetlands and some of the threats they're facing. Uh, but what is the global state of them? Well, sadly, we've lost 35% of our wetlands in the world since the 1970s. And that's not including the areas lost prior to that. We know that currently wetlands are being lost three times faster than our forests, which is a really staggering rate. Uh, and often, I think I mentioned before, these kind of green spaces are often highlighted more. Uh, and we often forget about these wetland environments. And in the UK, it's actually even more drastic as we've lost 90% of our wetlands in the past 100 years. However, it's not all doom and gloom, as currently we are the country with the greatest number of sites protected under Ramsar, uh, which is a global convention on wetlands, uh, which looks to actually protect and restore these environments. So now I'll talk a bit about urban wetlands, uh, and these are often missed out uh, when considering wetlands and nature. However, they are some of the most important habitats uh, that are present throughout our built up areas. Uh, and they even contribute to the maintenance of wetland, uh, sorry, the maintenance of urban areas uh, and their successes. So often our most developed cities are built up in and around wetlands due to the resources they provide, uh, particularly around coastal areas, uh, which have benefited from the shipping industry. Now, Plymouth is particularly special as it has amazing marine habitat, trees, and even Dartmoor on its doorstep, which hosts some really brilliant uh, Valley Maya communities. Um, however, urban areas can also contain those smaller wetland habitats, such as ponds, lakes, and streams. And they all provide really important habitats uh, and stepping stones for wildlife in areas where typically they won't survive. So another cool thing with wetlands uh, in urban areas, which also ties in with global warming, is that the presence of wetlands in cities can help offset something called the urban heat island effect, which essentially is where the amount of human activity increases the overall temperature of an area. Um, but by having areas of water and large bodies of water, this can help capture some of the heat and reduce the overall impact, making it a much nicer place to live. So in the UK, 84% of people live within urban environments, and this is often without decent access to nature. And this lack of access is often centered in kind of the more deprived areas. So therefore, by focusing on restoring and uh, constructing wetlands in these environments has combined benefits for both communities and, and nature itself. Uh, and one of the big things that actually wetlands can do uh, is have massive benefits for our mental health. And that's even more important nowadays uh, with kind of the social distancing we've had to deal with in the past and the kind of disconnect we uh, often have with the likes of social media being so popular. So blue spaces are often underrepresented when focusing and discussing access for nature and green spaces are way more widely recognized. However, blue spaces can massively help to improve people's well-being. So blue spaces have been shown to directly reduce stress, more so than green spaces alone. Um, and when you combine them together, then that can be brilliant. So there was a study of 16,000 people across 18 countries. They found that actually visiting watery nature decreased mental stress. Uh, so actually, the kind of sound of running water can be really peaceful. And that is true. It has a massive benefit for our mental health. In addition to that, people are more likely to socialize in blue spaces, um, which once again, after lockdowns is really important. And actually, it's great having connections online like we can do tonight. But actually, blue spaces can provide brilliant areas to socialize. But they also provide really good opportunities to be physical and active, uh, whether that's swimming, uh, paddle boarding, surfing, any of those things. But they can also provide some more sustainable means of travel, uh, moving up and down areas by boat can be quite an exciting way to see places. So I'm sort of reaching the end of uh, 
my talk now, but uh, there are different ways that we can develop wetland ecosystems within our environment. And these can range from really small things to a lot bigger things. Um, so something as simple as installing uh, drain pipe wetlands in gardens, which is essentially where you allow water to run off of your drain pipes into a certain area, uh, can actually support uh, plant species and mosses uh, and even other wildlife such as uh, amphibians. Or you could dig a small pond uh, in a community area, your back garden. Uh, and yeah, I, I think I've mentioned before, but ponds are fantastic. They support a whole variety of plants, a whole variety of insects, uh, mammals, uh, birds even. And actually in those urban environments where nature can be really disconnected, those small areas can be really vital in allowing species to interact and move throughout those in environments. So there's something called a rain garden, um, which is where you have areas of runoff from buildings, which utilize that water to once again support those wetland communities. But then we can look at big, bigger things such as restoring streams and rivers. So if they become blocked up, uh, you can start removing the debris, um, or you can even introduce beavers uh, in areas in Devon where it's happening. Um, or also you can create whole parks um, which are centered on wetlands. And that moves us quite nicely onto uh, Andrew's section where he will now kind of give you a talk about the work going on in Plymouth. So I'll uh, finish my section now and pass it over to Andrew. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, so um, my name is Andrew Canfield. I work for Plymouth City Council in the Environmental Planning Division. Uh, my role at the council is um, I'm a project manager really and I, I lead on um, Central Park Improvements Programme, which is a big um, programme of investment into the park. Um, I work on the Green Mines Programme and I'm the lead of Central Park on that and I also work on um, our investment work in the west of Plymouth, which is focusing on creating corridors for nature through that part of the city. Um, do you mind going on to the next slide, Jack? Uh, okay, um, so I thought um, what I'd do is start by showing you um, a video about the project and then sort of take you into a bit more detail what the project's about so i think it's on the next one central park is a wonderful natural space at the heart of plymouth enjoyed by thousands of people each year at the moment the pond and park drainage near the barn park entrance is ineffective meaning heavy rainfall can flood the area and cause drains to overflow making it hard for people to travel through the park. Introducing the Central Park Ponds Project, which will transform rainwater from a problem into a resource for wildlife and the community. By using a sustainable drainage system, or SUDS for short, we're going to harness the power of nature to improve the flow of rainwater and reduce flooding in a changing climate, in a way that complements the natural environment. Rainwater will be collected in a series of ponds, the existing pond and two new larger ponds that will hold water all year round and will journey here through redesigned granite drainage channels and a new swale, a shallow area of wet grassland with small dams and weirs that slow the flow of water and help it enter the ground. Whilst these changes involve reshaping areas of the park and removing a small number of trees, a large amount of new planting will help to capture rainwater and create a better place for wildlife like bees, birds, bats and frogs. New planting on vegetated walls and in other areas will need time to look its best, so will be fenced off temporarily and will soon come to life with wildflowers and other plants. Raising existing walkways, stepping stones and new viewing platforms with seating will allow visitors to connect with these wild areas and provide space for outdoor learning. We've received planning approval and engaged with the local community and experts, including the Devon Wildlife Trust, 
to make sure the project is based on best practice, which also feeds into a wider network of projects aimed at making Plymouth a sustainable, greener city. Keep an eye out for some exciting upcoming events where you can get involved and learn more. Thank you. <clears throat> Try and get on to the next slide. Thanks. So, um, I, I, what I wanted to do is just kind of pick up on some things from the video there and really like, uh, I guess, the benefits of why why we're doing this project. Um, so, I think just to give a bit of context of Central Park, Central Park is the largest park in Plymouth. It's one of the biggest green spaces in the city. Um, it's got lots of areas for wildlife, big areas of meadows, woodland, um, we've got Devon banks and hedgerows that date back a couple of hundred years. Um, it's really, its position in the city makes it a key corridor for wildlife to navigate the city and Central Park really features in all the strategic work that the council does around nature and the environment. Um, but alongside that we have uh, formal areas and lots of recreation areas, like a, a big play area, a skate park, sports pitches, and basically thousands of people visiting the park as well. So this project's really, you know, we, we're, we're trying to strike a balance between creating somewhere that's going to be great for nature, make more homes for nature, but also benefit people and, you know, just kind of picking up on things that have been said already, um, you know, but definitely it's going to be really valuable for people's health and well-being to be able to go and sit and look at water see water moving through the park um <clears throat> so um the the uh the project is actually underway now we've started work on site so moved on a little bit there from the, the video um and i think you know what's really great about the approach here is that we're using a sustainable drainage system so this is really an approach that's inspired by nature, taking a cue from nature, um, and it sort of is about managing water in, in various ways, so storing and capturing water, um, slowing it down and allowing it to come, enter into the ground, transporting it and moving it, so changing the way it moves through the park, um, and also through things like planting, evaporation. Um, so basically by doing this project, um, the, the actual area of the park is, is in sort of a high flood risk area. It's a catchment for the park that collects a lot of water and actually the park sits at the top of what used to be the Stonehouse Creek. So this would have connected into, you know, into the estuary and onwards um, before people came along and <laughs> changed the city and filled things in. Um, so. Um, so basically, by doing this project, we're going to actually help not just localise flooding in the park, but also flooding downstream that's kind of going into the current network that's collecting rainwater um, and might be affecting you know, flooding outside the park. And basically, as you kind of saw in the video there, the flooding in the park can be so significant on a really important access point that's part of not only how people commute and move through the park, but the strategic cycle network for the city. Um, so much water that you just can't even get through it. And to the point where it's overwhelming trees. So again, by doing this project, by storing the water, um, trying to capture as much rainwater as we can in this new system, um, it's gonna help to reduce that flooding and improve access for people moving through the park. Um, things we're doing in the project are as I said in the video, creating more ponds, creating more wildflower areas, planting trees, basically creating this, this wetland environment within the park, um, which is going to really benefit wildlife and create more space for wildlife. Um, alongside that, we're looking at how it could be a place to learn about water and nature. So there'll be access to the to one of the ponds for pond dipping. Um, we are through Green Minds working with the Arts University of Plymouth, looking at how we can have engaging signage so people can learn about wildlife. Um, you know, sit, like, sitting at the viewpoints, being able to look at, at the water there. Um, and as part of doing this, we've had to think about, you know, how can this be ready for climate change? So 
the way the, the project's been designed is it has to be able to collect a certain amount of water, has to be able to meet a certain kind of target. But all the measures in the scheme, like the tree planting, um, is going to help with cooling, um, help with carbon capture, similarly with the ponds and you know the plant life around that. That's going to help further with carbon capture as well in the scheme. And we've also needed to think a bit about you know how this works alongside the, the park because it's you know the park's park's been there for a long time and it does have heritage features so that kind of thing about the gravel drains is very much how we work with the heritage of the park to to create a sub solution but also to I mean you know keep those features from the park and reuse them and also looking at the fact that there are lots of mature trees along there that actually are being impacted by water damage if we don't take some action they are going to be liable to things like wind throw from erosion from water around their root systems and we've seen like a number of trees die from water damage so again part of what we're doing here is directing the water away from those areas the the, the swale that was mentioned is going to be a really key feature in terms of just capturing water keeping it away from the trees trans transferring that water into the pond system um, and I think to just talk a bit more about how we're working with Green Minds as well, um, and as we mentioned in the video, we're, we're obviously looking to try and run some events, get people involved in helping to care for this area. We already do a lot of work with community and volunteers coming to the park to help us, and, and we're keen to keep developing those links with people and involving the community in the project. And could you go on to the next slide? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I just I just wanted to pick up on some of our sustainable drainage solutions. Talked a bit about the swale um, and the ponds, but the, these are kind of really key features around how we're going to capture rainwater. Um, and also, I think what's going to be really nice with these with these parts is like they're going to change the way that water moves through the park and how people can experience the movement of water. At the moment, they're seeing big brown puddles and things they can't get through and lots of mud but things like the swale will allow like people to see the flow of water the stepping stones allow you to sort of cross and interact with it and um, the ponds will kind of give these nice spaces where you can see nature engage with nature or, or for reflection for health and well-being um there's going to be a lot of planting through this scheme planting a lot of trees um and that also includes creating new areas of hedgerow we're also using copse planting to kind of create little copses of trees or kind of create these little wetland areas. Um, so really like the, the project is creating this kind of system and mosaic of different um, areas for nature across the, the project. And the last thing I wanted to pick up on was this, this interesting uh, approach for using around this thing called vegetated walls. So um, the ponds have to sit alongside footpaths and the benefit of that is that will mean those kind of footpaths aren't flooded, but also that people will be able to go across those footpaths and get really close to the water. Um, and to do that, we're going to need some kind of reinforced walls to, to support the footpaths. But um, we're looking at using this approach, which is called vegetative walls, which looks a lot like sandbags. But as you can see, after a few months, basically the bags are full of soil and you can plant them with all sorts of things, with wildflower seed, you can plant them with trees if you want to. Um, actually, they'll go from looking like sandbags to in a few months, like looking green. And then after two months, you can see it's, it's like they're not even there. Um, and I just lastly wanted to mention that um, if you want to try and read a bit more about the project or like follow what's happening in the project, um, you can go to the Green Minds Plymouth website um, and under the projects, Central Park is referred to as Rethinking an Urban Park. Thank you, um, Andrew, and thank you, Jack. Um, brilliant talk and brilliant to know what's going on sort of locally to Plymouth. Um, uh, if people enjoyed Jack's talk, he did do a fantastic one on fungi for us. So that's one to look out for on the Green Minds YouTube channel. Um, and I've learned a new word tonight, re-wiggling. So uh, <laughs> I, I won't forget that in a hurry. Re-wiggle all the waterways. Brilliant.
Um, so I have got a couple of questions, and that's good because we've got about five minutes, <laughs> uh, and I'll ask those. But also, if you've got any feedback or just general comments, uh, please put them in the chat. That's really useful for us to have for our sort of evaluation and in improving events um, in the future. So uh, let me see. I've got um, a question. Uh, yes, slightly contentious question, perhaps. Should do you think that the environment agency should be more active in preventing water companies to discharge sewage into water courses at times of heavy flow? Um, any thoughts on that, <laughs> Jack? I think, I, I think yes. <laughs> I think simply. most of us would agree with that, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're seeing a lot of issues um, with yeah discharging our waterways. And um, I know there's a lot of issue with um, kind of pollutants from chicken farms and waterways and rivers as well at the moment. And there's yeah not not a lot being done really at the moment. I think it's often overlooked. So yeah, the more that can be done to clean up our our water systems, the, mm. the better really. Mm. Um, I'm not sure whether we're answer this, but um, we've got uh, um, someone who's. Uh, joining us from Worcester, uh, welcome. Um, and they saying that there they rely heavily on floodplain meadows to help manage the River Seven flooding. <laughs> and what sort of things should they be asking their sort of council about um, how they're managing the space to support sort of wildlife? And I guess I mean the first thing to me is is the River Seven is a pretty big river, uh, and um, here in South Devon and Plymouth, a lot of our rivers are are quite very short and sharp and so what tends to happen is we get heavy rainfall and they sort of flood really quickly and then it kind of goes down again doesn't it but I, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on floodplain meadow, meadows or um, finding out more data about biodiversity of those. Yeah I think it's it's really important to monitor those sites and um, so actually to understand what species are there and are thriving in terms of biodiversity and uh, also making sure they're protected um, not being enriched by kind of any agricultural land that's adjacent because that can be a big issue with them but yeah I think it's always a good thing to to monitor these environments because uh, then you have a nice baseline that you can actually look back on and see how things are changing yeah okay and then we've got um some in, uh, message from a someone who's a lecturer in ecosystem resilience at the University of Plymouth uh, for research focusing on wetland carbon dynamics so and would be keen to connect on local wetland work. So um, yes, I guess um, we'll. I'll make a note and we'll perhaps we'll uh, drop you an email <laughs> separately to this about that. Thank you, um, Scott. Uh, happy to chat if interested. Uh, and also, um, he's saying that he's a co-founder of the Wet Woodlands Research Network. Yeah, so if Jack, that might be interesting to you or anyone else. That's yeah, wetwoodlands.com if anyone's interested in that. And they've got some doing some research in the southwest. So sounds like there's some bit of crossover there. Um, I think uh, uh, your. I mean, if people wanted to email you direct, Jack, um, your your work emails jrivers at devonwildlifetrust.org. Yeah. Um, so jrivers at devonwildlifetrust.org and if anyone wanted to message me I'm the same but hpar uh, and the same uh, at devonwildlifetrust.org um, I think and there's a few people who've joined us from Milton Keynes as well um, they've got a lot of wetlands in their parks across the city um, and one park created recently was the floodplain forest nature reserve created following gravel extraction um, yeah I think a lot of things like gravel gravel pits and old quarries and things can be um, repurposed quite successfully. I think the fact that Devon Wildlife Trust have done that with their Meath Quarry um, na uh, Nature Reserve uh, in North Devon. Um, people can read about that on our website if interested. So yes, so and they said anyone's welcome to come and visit them there. <laughs> so yeah, go along. And that's all the questions that I've got there. Uh, and actually, we've got a couple of minutes left. I mean, I was just amazed at the huge variety of wet, those different wetlands. I hadn't necessarily a thought of even like the ocean as a wetland, but there's one like enormous wetland, isn't it? Um, and in terms of what individuals can do, I know um, Jack, you sort of mentioned about doing a water feature in your garden. And I think we did a wildlife gardening talk last year and 
uh, somebody after that sent us tweeted that he'd popped like an old washing up bowl in his garden <laughs> and within about two hours there was like a, a, some blackbirds having a little bath in there so it, it was really like a really simple thing that everyone could do because some I think some of these issues and facing us with the wetlands and degradation of wetlands and the climate crisis and pollution is can feel a bit overwhelming at times can't it but there are things that we can all do as individuals you know there are millions of gardens in the UK so if everyone popped a, a, a water feature or a, a boggy area in their garden and I was thinking also you were saying about peat not using any compost that has peat in I think that's a really critical thing that everyone can do just always buy the peat free compost when you're doing your gardening shop at the garden centre and and try not to well don't use any chemicals in your garden because inevitably those sort of pesticides get sort of washed off into drains and think about what you're pouring down your drains in your house and garden I think um, are there any other things that we can think of that are good that individuals can do I think uh, as part of the Devon Biodiversity Record Centre recording, that's always a good thing. Um, even if you don't know what you're doing with recording wildlife, it's always a good thing to get into. Um, so kind of wetland birds are a nice one, uh, any wetland plants, insects. Um, it's just fun to observe those things as well. But um, yeah, making records is really helpful for us. Um, and what's the DBRC website address again? If people can actually report any sightings in Devon, can't yeah, they? I'm not actually sure. <laughs> I just get, look up Devon Biodiversity Record Centre. Um, yeah, there's yeah. a there's a nice uh, easy form. You can I'll, I'll put that actually. Website. I'll do a follow up email and I will put any any sort of useful links in there that have come out of the chat and that have come out of today. So I think we're just about out of time. So. Um, thank you. I just want to say thank you very much to Jack uh, and to Andrew for giving up their time this evening and also to everyone for joining us. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you again at another event soon. Thanks very much.